Okay, let's start panel two. Um, good evening from Hong Kong. My name is Hao Chen. I teach intellectual property at University of Hong Kong, and I'm a co-organizer of this conference. Uh, the previous panel explored various complicated issues about expanding uh, COVID-19 vaccines from uh, legal, political, and scientific perspectives. So uh, as you know, vaccines are very important, but they are not the only you know, aspect uh, or critical element in dealing with the uh, pandemic or future pandemic, pandemics. Uh, we, uh, we have many other things that are also very important, such as contact tracing, uh, the provision of medicine for curing um, you know, COVID infection and uh, other you know, innovations that are also necessary. So uh, this panel uh, is going to explore other means of uh, coping with the current pandemic and, and future pandemics. So we have a panel of uh, very distinguished speakers. And uh, um, so um, I will invite them to speak in turn. And for attendees, please type uh, your question and comments um, in the Q&A box at any time. So uh, our first speak for, speaker for tonight's panel is uh, Professor Lawrence Galston. Um, he is absolutely the most uh, uh, cited uh, scholar in the health law field uh, and is a towering figure in the field. And uh, he's university professor at uh, Georgetown University and uh, the director of the very famous O'Neill Institute for uh, national and global health law. Unfortunately, he's not able to join us tonight, but he was very kind that he made a pre-recorded video uh, uh, to share his thoughts at this conference. So uh, let's hear about his thoughts. Hi, um, I'm Larry Gostin and I'm really delighted um, to be with you uh, on this really um, important conference, uh, looking at the question of how do we vaccinate the world? You know, it's no secret that the deep inequity in global vaccination is perhaps the moral failure of our generation. It's really unconscionable um, that so much of the benefits of science and medical technology have gone to um, the United States, Europe, uh, and other high income countries, um, while low and middle income countries um, have been left behind. Um, there are some exceptions, of course. Um, India, by its own um, bold and, and admirable, uh, vaccine production capacity through the Serum Institute of India um, is rapidly um, vaccinating its population. And it's a huge population, the second largest in the world. Um, but for the most part in Latin America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, um, parts of Southeast Asia, um, we're seeing um, just desperate um, governments trying to uh, forge contracts with a few monopolistic uh, vaccine producers um, at extortionate um, prices and with extortionate terms. We badly need um, United States and its partners to step up um, with a bold global plan. In September, uh, President Biden uh, hosted a side session at the UN General Assembly um, where he promised to vaccinate 70% uh, of the world by uh, next September, 2022. Um, but notably, he didn't really propose a plan um, to do that. Um, and while um, he's pledged over a billion doses of vaccines, he's delivered um, just a fraction of that. Um, and as well, uh, there's no 
a clear strategy of how we get to the 70% 70, 70 vaccination coverage. Moreover, uh, I believe strongly that we can't wait for a year um, with you know, hundreds of thousands of preventable lives lost um, and the prospect for a variant um, to emerge that's even more dangerous than the Delta variant. Um, we need to vaccinate the world um, within six months um, at 70%. And by a year's time, we should be well above the 80% global vaccination coverage. Uh, this is not only a moral calling, but it's also very much in our uh, national interests because so long as there's unchecked um, SARS-CoV-2 transmission and mutations globally, um, it will seed uh, another uh, uh, variant that could even evade current vaccine technologies um, that would travel back to the United States, recalling that all of the major variants have already um, uh, occurred abroad. Um, so what should Biden um, be doing? Um, first, um, he should really push on his pledge um, for an intellectual property waiver at the World Trade Organization. Um, Europe has been blocking it. Um, he needs to use all the influence that we can um, to create that waiver. But I'm gonna talk more about um, the importance of IP waivers, but also technology transfers in just a minute. But first, um, our donations. Um, donations are the, the our potentially fastest way of getting vaccine doses out to the world. And when we do that, we also have to build a vaccine infrastructure. We need trained vaccinators. We need health education and outreach. We need a reliable and stable um, electricity um, supply for cold storage. We need roads to get it to people. And so this is an enormous financial um, and logistical undertaking. Uh, getting donations um, will require ramped up um, domestic vac vaccination production, uh, in particular um, with messenger RNA vaccines. These vaccines um, are the ones that are most capable of rapid um, amplification of production, much more so than traditional vector vaccines like AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson um, vaccines. And for that, um, Biden needs to use all of his influence over um, Pfizer and Moderna. Um, and he needs, if necessary, um, to utilize the Defense Production Act uh, to require these companies to ramp up production. Um, Moderna has said that it's going to open up a hub uh, in Africa, but that won't be for a year or two. Um, and it's really not a serious proposal because uh, Moderna doesn't say when it's going to open that hub in what country or why it's not using the um, South African um, WHO supported mRNA uh, vaccine hub. Um, so there's much to do. But in addition to donations, uh, we need to do something much more and much bolder. The truth is, is that low and middle income countries are absolutely fed up um, of relying on uh, rich country charity and charitable donations. Uh, we know historically that these donations always seem to come late and in insufficient quality and quantity. Uh, and so we need to actually empower uh, key vaccine producers uh, in particularly middle-income countries 
um, to develop their own vaccines. Um, but this will require both technology transfer uh, and uh, ample funding from uh, rich nations. And so we need to see uh, companies like the Serum Institute of India, other vaccine manufacturers in places like South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia, um, to create, to gain the capacity to make their own messenger RNA vaccines. This requires President Biden to use his leverage over Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. After all, um, the United States and other high income countries have funded um, the development of mRNA vaccines um, to a very handsome tune and truly in ways that have given these companies huge profits. Moderna got um, a large windfall um, out of Operation Warp Speed, and both Moderna and Pfizer have benefited from over uh, a decade of uh, basic NIH funding um, for mRNA technology platforms. Uh, at the same time, we pre-purchased doses at premium prices um, to both of these vaccine manufacturers. They owe America, they owe the world a much greater social duty. Um, they have actually been horrific and uh, particularly uh, they have used almost extortionate leverage in low-income countries to exact uh, high prices uh, and unacceptable um, terms uh, when these poor countries have very little um, leverage in an unequal bargaining position for these vaccine contracts. Uh, we want to enable these countries to be able to make the vaccine themselves. This requires um, uh, transferring technology um, making available um, uh, uh, trade secrets and, and the know-how to do it, as well as ample technical assistance and financial resources to build up um, these uh, regional hubs for uh, manufacturing of vaccines. Uh, donating a dose is great. It can save a life, but empowering countries to to make their own vaccines can save a country or a whole region or the world. At the same time, uh, this isn't just important for the current COVID-19 pandemic. We also want these capacities to make their own diagnostics, uh, therapeutics and treatments uh, and vaccines uh, in low and middle income countries for future outbreaks and epidemics. Um, we don't want to repeat the failure of uh, going uh, begging hat in hand for donations. Uh, we want to empower countries to, to protect their own lives, their own citizens, their own regions. Um, so there's so much that we need to do. I'm so delighted um, uh, that Georgetown is hosting um, this vital uh, meeting on a global vaccination. Um, the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown has been um, uh, organizing a sign-on letter um, that went to President Biden and to congressional leaders, signed by 60 of the most prominent uh, scientists and global health experts in the United States as well as you know, most of the major organizations like the National Academies of Science, the American Public Health Association and others. Um, we need to really demand action. I think President Biden, uh, unlike his predecessor, is an internationalist. He's got compassionate feelings um, for everyone in the world. He believes in justice, but now we need and to take that really hard political step of using all the United States leverage, both legal and financial, um, to vaccinate the world and to do it now. <laughs>
Thank you very much um, for inviting me to, to give this welcome. And I wish you all um, very uh, good success with this meeting. Thank you, Professor Gostin. Although you're not here, but your talk really, uh, you know, uh, inspired me a lot. I I'm sure that, you know, the audience has been inspired a lot as well. And I like the, the word empower he used, empowering uh, developing countries to produce uh, vaccines locally. Uh, so uh, this is uh, fabulous. So our next speaker is Professor Fami Ariwa. Uh, she is uh, Shesterman Professor of Transnational and Business Law at Temple University School of Law. Uh, she is going to talk about decolonizing the digital economy, innovation models, financing, and law. Professor Ariwa, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to first start by uh, thanking Professor Sundar and um, Sun for putting on this timely and critically important discussion. So my remarks today, I think, are going to follow on Professor Gostin's remarks. And they're also going to, re re um, I'm going to focus today on discussing background issues in relation to law and policy that are, that are drawn from the discussion of my book published um, in July 2021. And that book is entitled Disrupting Africa, Techne Technology, Law and Development. It focuses on the need to craft truly local approaches in the digital economy era and the necessity to just disrupt past patterns and decolonize digital economy law and policymaking contexts in Africa. My, my fo the focus of my remarks is going to be on um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So I think COVID highlights the consequences of what I refer to as colonial overhang in my book, as well as uh, structural inequalities, um, fundamental structural impediments and inequalities that are that are to a significant degree baked in right now in global and local context. That doesn't mean they can be they can't be disrupted. However, they they reflect a long historical pattern of dealing with countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that needs to, where we need to devote significant attention as Professor Gostin underscores to disrupting these past patterns. And a lot of these past patterns reflect exploitation. It's a critically important goal that responses to COVID and future epidemics have to unfold in an environment where we disrupt these impediments and inequalities. Notably, um, the uh, mRNA manufacturers have, have been supplying shots mostly to wealthy nations um, and keeping poorer countries waiting. They have, however, been extracting a significant amount of profits. Um, some estimates suggest that they've, they're charging governments as much as $41 billion above the est estimated cost of production. Colombia specifically, Colombia specifically is noted as having paid potentially as much as $375 million over cost of manufacture. And there's some reports that Moderna is actually charging higher prices in developing countries than it's charging in developed countries. So solutions, as Professor Gostin's remarks underscore, solutions and policy approaches to COVID should need to apply not just to COVID, but should be the start of a process that disrupts the structural impediments and inequalities that I'm gonna talk on, speak about in the rest of my remarks and facilitate the development of future local capacity to respond not only to pandemics, but other issues and concerns that arise in particular local contexts. So it's important to underscore the fact that global vaccine inequality highlights longstanding issues present in um, contexts in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere in the world. One of those contexts is a question of legal and policy mis mismatch. This is a pervasive global, global problem that is relevant in very digital economy contexts and in relation to the COVID pandemic. That basically, and this has been described by speakers in our earlier panel, that speaks about how do we apply existing laws and regulations to take account of new things, be it new technologies or new diseases and pandemics. Um, in many contexts in Sub-Saharan Africa, the uh, issues that arise from legal and policy mismatch are made more difficult by what I refer to in my book as colonial at overhang. Um, a colonial overhang um, is a key remnant of colonialism. It's what I refer to as a ghost of colonialism. And a key part of that legacy is, is patterns of external determination. Now, external determination is reflected in a lot of different things. It's reflected in models of governance, pause policies and law that were de developed during colonialism with an external orientation 
and external sources of authority that continues to be active in many African contexts and a continuing basis for how to access the, inter the external in law and policymaking contexts. This relates to what I refer to as problems of indiscriminate borrowing from external sources of both laws and policies that, um, that themselves come with past histories, context, assumptions, disputes, and accommodations. It also, colonial overhang is also reflected in continu continuing flows of knowledge that's evident in our discussions of tech technology transfer today. During colonialism, flows of knowledge were based on patterns of exploitation that treated countries that were then colonies as sources of raw materials while excluding such countries from access to knowledge and information that could add value locally. That shape of knowledge distribution continues in the post-colonial world in a very strong way. We had limited infrastructure developed internally, um, a focus during colonialism on mine to port infrastructure, which has not been significantly disrupted post-colonially, although I would note that um, Chinese activities in the infrastructure arena are, is disrupting some of the patterns that we saw as being really um, evident during colonialism. We also have a, a key legacy of um, colonial overhang, or a continuing legacy of colonial overhang is a persistent pattern of insufficient consideration of the local, again, as, an, as is evident in our discussions of technology transfer today. In the case of intellectual property laws, patterns of external determination have led to fractured and fragmented intellectual property frameworks. Legal scholar um, Titi Adebola in her discussion of IP laws in African countries, she describes um, IP laws in many African contexts as comp uh, comprising an array of partially overlapping and sometimes conflicting agreements, laws, policies, and sub-regional organizations. So, what we need is a need for focused policies and agendas that take better account of the local. Um, and I want to draw attention to um, the African Policy Research Institute, a Berlin think tank, um, did a policy brief in September 2021. And the title is, what, what is Africa's Digital Agenda? And I think it has relevance to um, our discussions of uh, COVID, African countries in the context of COVID. And, um, APRI notes the need to ensure that policies and strategies are not indiscriminately copied from other contexts. National and regional policymakers should exercise creativity and judgment that reflect the specificities of African contexts in formulating their digital policies. And I would add COVID policies with respect to COVID and uh, public health to the list of things that APRI was referring to. So in my remaining time, I want to discuss three aspects of colonial overhang that highlight the challenges of inclusion in an era of COVID. I've, I'm going to talk about COVID, equality, COVID inequality and what I refer to as double marginalization. I want to talk about structures and strategies surrounding innovation. And thirdly, I want to talk about funding innovation in an era of COVID. So I want to first of all talk about COVID inequality and double marginalization. In many African contexts, we see colonial overhang is evident in COVID inequality and patterns of double marginalization. Now, the first level of marginalization is global, and it's evident in the exclusion of African countries from global power relationships. And this is it's also reflected in top-down approaches towards African countries, where and that is it reflects is reflected in external determination, where policy and legal priorities come from top-down approaches. As the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres noted in July 2020, the legacy of colonialism still rever reverberates. We see this in the global trade system. Economies that were colonized are at greater risk of getting locked into the production of raw materials and low tech goods, a new form of colonialism. And we see this in global power relations. So the marginalization in the digital era is generally reflected if we look at many African countries, which are sources of raw Rare, rare, rare earth metals, for instance, but um, recipients of manufactured technology and other goods and products, which is not significantly different than the colonial era. In an era of COVID, marginalization is highlighted with um, by lack of access to vaccines and lack of um, local capacity or ability to produce um, vaccine. In South Africa's context, South Africa is um, has the best R&D 
um, and technology capacity in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, to, South Africa could actually produce the vaccine, but as we've heard about um, from other speakers, there's some impediments to doing that. So the first level of marginalization is this global marginalization of African countries from global trade flows and a particular pattern of engagement on disadvantageous terms locally. The second level of marginaliza marginalization is internal, and it's reflected in the exclusion and marginalization of the majority of population in many countries in Africa. And that has significance for how we think about deploying um, responses to COVID in many African contexts. As the World um, Bank has noted, 40% of the population um, lived below the poverty line in sub-Saharan African context, and the poverty line the World Bank defines as $1.90 a day per person. And this accounted for two-thirds of the global extreme poor population. Notably, Nigeria um, in 2018 surpassed India as having the most absolute number of people in poverty, in extreme poverty, despite the fact that India's population is more than six times that of Nigeria. So now, while the poverty rate has decreased from 56% in 1990 to 40% in 2018, the number of poor continues to rise. So um, in 2018, there were an estimated 433 million people in African countries, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in poverty, as compared to 284 million in 1990. So this pervasive poverty and double marginalization are things to really attend to in the deployment of um, resistance to COVID in many, in many sub-Saharan African contexts. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is structures and strategies surrounding innovation. Um, so we know that, as I mentioned, laws and policies um, that are evident in digital economy and COVID contexts are reflect this pattern of double marginalization. Um, now, there's a the persistent lack of uh, local consideration hampers policy responses and planning it, during COVID as well as in, in pre-COVID contexts. Um, as, as many others have noted, African countries have not vaccinated much of the population. As of, uh, as of late October 2020, um, only 15 countries in Africa um, had achieved the global goal of vaccinating 10% of their populations against the disease by the end of September. Um, we've had local uh, COVAX, we've had limited local COVAX vaccine deliveries in African context, and many uh, wealthy countries are hoarding vaccine. And I think as Professor Gostin um, points out, it's, it is a moral um, issue, and it's it's, it, it raises significant questions about um, how do we think about harm and morality um, in global context. Notably, however, even if vaccines were to flow in greater quantities to countries in Africa, some of the limitations that are reflected in the patterns of double marginaliz marginalization I talked about would also um, perhaps impede delivery of actual vaccine. In late October 2021, UNICEF estimates that um, the need, if, if given if, if we're going to reach COVID vaccination targets in African countries, even if we assumed an unhindered vaccine supply in 2022, there could be a shortfall of up to 2.2 billion auto disabled syringes. Um, so that's that's a considerable problem, particularly in African context. As a result, um, COVID is likely to cause much more harm in African context, both in terms of lost, lost lives and disease, as well as in terms of economic projections. The IMF projects that Sub-Saharan Africa is um, going to be the slowest region to recover economically from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, underlying a lot of the responses to COVID are insufficiencies in measurement that are a persistent problem across Africa. Um, COVID shows the consequences of a lack of measurement of COVID cases. Um, we know COVID, as I mentioned, has high human cost um, because, uh, it, it, particularly in African context, because the number of people being infected um, and the number of people dying have been severely estimated, underestimated. According to official data, um, in African context, 19,000 people have died from COVID-19, this is in South Africa, have, had died from COVID-19 since the beginning of the epidemic. However, a study in the Journal of Population Sciences in September 2020 by researchers at the University of Cape Town actually found a total of 240,000 excess, excess deaths that they thought could be linked to the virus. Now, these estimates suggest we need to be able to measure um, COVID deaths better, and South Africa actually has the best measurement capabilities in Sub-Saharan Africa, so the miscount is probably greater in many other contexts. WHO estimates estimates that less than 15% of the six or six in seven COVID infections go undetected, uh, go detected in African context. 
Um, so, and this reflects, is partly a consequence of the fact that African countries are doing fewer tests. Um, the most tested country according to WHO statistics is Gabon, which um, administered five, 50 tests per 100 people. South Africa, 30 tests per 100 people. To compare, Austria, Austria does 1,038 tests per 100, UK 412, and the United States 170 tests per 100,000. So COVID-19 um, highlights the consequences of a lack of effective strategy for dealing with the internal and external. And I think underscores the urgent need for a couple of different things. Um, uh, the need to address patent reform and um, issues related to patent examination within Africa, insufficient local ability to manufacture vaccine for the continent, and inability to un un overcome persistent patterns of, uh, patterns of exclusion that have left African countries on the outside in terms of vaccine access. So the last thing I want to make in my final remark, last point I want to make in my final remarks is I want to talk about how we fund innovation um, within African contexts locally, and I want to talk about the role of the external and funding processes. So we have inadequate internal funding of innovation and innovation ecosystems throughout Africa. And I want to highlight the fact that R&D funding, research and development funding, and STEM capacity are of critical importance in laying the groundwork for local ability to address COVID-19 and other healthcare and digital economy needs in African contexts. African countries currently suffer from a tremendous deficit in science, scientific and technology infrastructure that contributes to a significant gap in research capacity between Sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the world. And I, I just, and this is a continuing issue, I'll point to a couple of statistics. In 2008, Sub-Saharan African countries accounted for less than 1% of the world's research output while being home to 13.5% of global population. And that Sub-Saharan Africa produced the same number of research papers as the Netherlands. The number of scientists engaged in R&D um, per million is an important measure of, of capacity, development capacity and scientific capacity, because such scientists are key performers of R&D aimed at increasing the stock of knowledge and devising new applications to ensure sustainable development. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa lags most of, most of the world in expenditures as a percentage of GDP and the number of R&D scientists per million people. Um, so for research output, we see patterns of external engagement that are familiar playing out. Countries in Sub-Saharan Africa rely to a significant degree on external networks, including through international co collaborations and visiting researchers. Um, so current internal research capacity reflects low levels of local R&D investment in Sub-Saharan Africa, which means that research is highly dependent on external funding and often not through, um, and that raises two questions that I want to end with in my remarks. Um, we, we have various sources of uh, financing within Africa. Some, there's a lack of internal funding. Looking at external funding, I want to talk about private funding, funding from private sources and public funding, and then I'll conclude. Um, private funding in sub saharan African content may be driven by biases imported with investors. And this, these may replicate patterns of uh, racial patterns and funding biases evident in places like Silicon Valley and other contexts, which um, tech cabal in Nigeria has described as a new form of, a form of neocolonialism. There's a tendency in African context to fund people other than Africans in context of development, at least of new technologies. July 2020, The Guardian had an article entitled, Silicon Valley has deep pockets for African startups if you're not African. So if 17 companies that raised a million dollars or more from venture capital investments in Kenya in 2019, only one was actually funded by locals. Um, four were founded by, a, uh, founded by a mix of expats and locals and 11 of the 17 were uh, expat companies. External, um, and we have some also funding biases in the public health context. Um, external funding in public health may be driven by external needs and often funding external institutions. I want to draw attention to an article in Nature Medicine from April 2015. It was actually an, an open letter to the editor that basically says that a lot of public external funding doesn't actually go to institutions in Africa. So the article talks about a $30 million U.S. grant awarded to non, a non-profit uh, non health organization PATH in the U.S., and it funded a consortium of seven institutions all outside of Africa to support African countries in the improved use of data for decision making in malaria control and, and elimination. Now, this grant isn't going to fund and develop institutions in Africa, but rather fund external parties that are um, going to operate in Africa. Not one African institution was named in the press release. And, um, and this is despite the fact that the 
we've had in the recent year, in the, at least the last year or so, of uh, calls from staff and collaborators for equality and inclusion. So I want to note, if we look at malaria funding, of the $1.1 billion spent on malaria development aid, it mostly goes to institutions outside of Africa, Western institutions. So public and private funding have raised some issues about how we engage with the internal in African countries. So I want to end by saying solutions and policy approaches to COVID should not just apply to COVID, but should be a start of a process that disrupts these structural impediments and inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ariwa. So let's uh, turn to the next speaker, my colleague, Professor Calvin Ho. Um, Calvin is a social professor of law and my faculty and also directs the Center for Medical Ethics and Law. Um, so Calvin, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Houghton, and um, a, a, a note of thanks to Professor Matthew Sundar as well for this wonderful opportunity to engage in a certainly very important discussion, very pertinent for our time and, and also in thinking about how to move forward with some of these challenges. I do have some share, uh, slides to share, so let me just uh, uh, give us to start. Uh, so uh, I, I am a member of the uh, Act A, Ethics Working Group of the World Health Organization, WHO. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll be speaking a bit uh, on, on this particular setup. Um, uh, we have uh, had a very helpful introduction from Professor Kavanagh. Uh, so I, I won't dwell too much on the details, but just also to note that um, views are, of course, personal to myself. But if you should be interested in some of the discussions in this presentation. I'm happy to say that uh, I, I have in collaboration with a number of our uh, members of the working group uh, uh, written up a paper uh, which will be published shortly in The Lancet. So do look out for that if you, you should be interested. So um, for today's presentation, I thought we could start off with three questions to consider. So as you see on the slides, um, I'm, I'm quite keen to to understand or to learn the views of uh, this very eminent panel, as well as uh, panel members who presented earlier, if intellectual property rights enhance the capability of countries in pandemic response. So I highlighted the word capability because I, I take this uh, particular ethical approach or ethical lens in looking at some of these developments. So when I say capability, uh, they of course relate to uh, capability of countries to develop vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics, uh, promoting availability and access to these countermeasures, and very importantly, to reduce the global health gap, uh, as we have heard quite a lot about today. So, uh, so that's the first question. The second question is to what extent are existing challenges attributable to IPR? So uh, we have heard some pa panel members speak to this. And I thought I'd want to take up this discussion in relation to a paper or a, a blog entry that's a very instructive one, in fact, written by uh, Anna Santos Rushman, whom I understand is on the panel. So I'll be very keen to hear her thoughts uh, on at least my view of her position. And, uh, and finally, in terms of the third question, I thought it'd be helpful to uh, take a longer term view of what some of these developments uh, have been and how they are likely to impact on global health equity. Of course, from uh, a capability approach, I do think that um, justice or equity ought to be the center focus of uh, any thinking moving forward. So this is also in keeping with uh, a Rosian approach in terms of uh, his uh, liberal egalitarian sort of model. So um, as we have heard, there have been a number of platforms for vaccine development. Uh, I too, like all the other panel members, will focus on the mRNA, uh, mRNA platform uh, because I, I think for reasons have, uh, that have already been shared, uh, the, the, the most promising sort of technology in response to this particular virus. But what I thought interesting, if we look at this particular chart, of course, is to see where the developers of these vaccines are mostly based. Uh, so it, uh, I, I think it lends some weight to what the previous speaker has mentioned in terms of um, 
neocolonialism that continues to persist today in terms of some of the structural inequalities, particularly within a global health setting. So I've made reference to uh, Anna's paper. So, uh, so here are some points that, um, that um, I, I want to highlight from her discussion. Um, well, I'm not sure whether the slides are, uh, are clear in terms of the claims. Uh, on my slide, all the positions uh, or the claim as well as objections have been set out. So I, I, I hope they are clear. The way I designed the slide was that they, they were supposed to be sequential uh, and floating out uh, as I speak, but apparently this is not going to happen. So sorry about that. Uh, but if they are on the slides, as you see, the claim that's being made is that uh, if, if we do away with the exclusionary right, of course, this is in relation to the patent waiver discussion. So if we do away with the exclusionary rights for a certain period of time, uh, other companies will be able to replicate existing vaccines and manufacture at scale so that considerably more doses of vaccines will start flowing towards populations in the global south. So, so that's the uh, the, the claim or, or uh, well, claim, it was, excuse me, yeah, essentially claim made by advocates for the IP waiver. Uh, and, and I thought what's interesting about Anna's paper here is the objection uh, or objections rather that's presented in response to this claim. So objection one says that uh, information disclosed would not increase available or the availability of vaccines in the global south. So uh, I, I thought they quite helpfully pointed out that unlike compulsory licensing, if we were to dislodge uh, the exclusivity problems, uh, it will. It may not necessarily lead to greater access because it's not simply a matter of bringing the price down. Uh, and I think there is fair basis in holding this or holding on to this particular objection. And then they raised another objection in that a waiver. Uh, uh, may solve the exclusive exclusivity problem, but not the information problem that of course undergirds vaccine manufacturing. Of course, this would uh, relate to the processes in producing a biologic or biological product as uh, we have heard uh, an earlier uh, panel member speak about. Um, and of course, uh, related to the, the, this part of the objection is that uh, the uh, in many countries that there just simply isn't enough infrastructure or raw materials to produce and distribute the COVID-19 vaccines. And finally, of course, there will be the uncertainty that such a waiver would create in the future world. And I think that these are uh, sound objections and something that we do need to think quite carefully. So, so their counterclaim is that we have uh, a contractual and infrastructure, infrastructural problem that's looking at it collectively uh, and not an intellectual property problem. So I thought this is a, a very interesting argument. Uh, I, I do think that it might be a bit too broad in terms of its claim. Uh, I do think that there are some merits to thinking about uh, an IP waiver um, for these reasons. So firstly, I do think that, um, and again, I'd love to hear what Anna has to say about this. So I, I do think that uh, we, we need to adopt a broader conception of intellectual property. Here, I, I thought that her arguments are, or their arguments in, in, uh, in the excellently written paper um, presents too narrow a construction of intellectual property. And if we were to understand intellectual property rights, uh, as with other property rights, they, they are relational. And, and as we have seen, the law tends to treat them as relational. And hence, we do have a number of mechanisms that we have heard of today. Uh, I do think that intellectual property rights on this basis should not be viewed apart from systems within which they are embedded. So we do need to adopt a broader systemic approach. And, and it should be applied in a way, intellectual property rights embedded in systems to support particular normative ends. So, uh, and uh, on that point, I do think that simply promoting innovation is not an end unto itself certainly not from a normative standpoint. So instead, I think that it's necessary to adopt uh, what I would argue would be a whole life informational approach. So I will elaborate a little bit more on what this means. Uh, but by this approach, it does require us to evaluate how and where intellectual property rights uh, should be 
from a normative standpoint in ensuring the availability of as well as access to vaccines and in a manner that's consistent with global health equity. So uh, on this basis, it does mean that we should have IP waiver as a policy option uh, that is to be seriously considered and pursued uh, and mechanisms, of course, to support that as well. So, of course, I'm not saying that all IP rights for that matter, but, uh, but then there ought to be mechanisms that can help make available important informational resources in order to capacitate stakeholders, particularly countries, to be able to develop effective develop as well as implement uh, effective pandemic countermeasures. So this, um, I would argue, is in keeping with the capability approach. And of course, by capability approach, I, I refer to, uh, as we all know, Amatia Sen, Martin Nussbaum and others, uh, they have argued. And, and what's interesting is that uh, this position, um, in, in a way, has helped to justify a number of important uh, stakeholders or, or players very much engage in developing pandemic countermeasures. So, so that would be SEPI, Gavi, as well as uh, we also see this in the WHO R&D blueprint, uh, consultation of which is uh, still ongoing, I believe. So uh, in, in, in terms of how the blueprint should move forward in the light of the pandemic. So by capabilities, I, I think we're not starting from uh, a, a blank slate. So the IHR, the International Health Regulations, uh, for that matter, has made some important references and in fact, specified indicators. And, and I think these are important references because we do need to have quite a critical assessment of where we are, uh, given the setup. So we have the uh, intellectual property regimes, and then we also have Act A. So I'm going to talk more about Act A uh, in a bit. But how do all of these uh, mechanisms or measures and systems uh, add up in terms of systemic capability in responding to the pandemic? So as we have seen, in some areas, quite good, but in others, not good at all. So certainly on the access and availability point, we, uh, we have, uh, as other um, panelists have, have very eloquently explained, uh, fallen very much short of the normative goals. So looking beyond IPR and looking at how IPR is embedded, so we do have the Act A mechanism. So we can think of this as, in a sense, a platform. So, um, so I, I, I greatly appreciate uh, Dr. Kavanagh's uh, thoughts on Act A. Uh, I, I adopt a somewhat less a uh, skeptical view, but that said, I, I do think that it's not a perfect setup. It does represent a mechanism for public-private engagement, uh, and it does allow some room for negotiation and development. So uh, at the point of the, uh, the pandemic, it was very quickly put together. Uh, and uh, as uh, Dr. Kavanagh mentioned earlier, uh, it was meant to be very much uh, a loose setup in order to ensure that there is flexibility. So it did not want to be uh, held up or delayed by, uh, by, by bureaucratic or administrative requirements. So, so that was the, the initial um, kind of thinking behind Act A. And as you see, there, there have been uh, overall plans uh, being put together in terms of how to make available vaccines, therapeutics, as well as diagnostics. And uh, within such a, an overall plan, there were also clear targets that have been set for, um, for each of these countermeasures. But then we, of course, with the benefit of hindsight now know that there are, are quite a few problems in implementing uh, these mechanisms appropriately. Uh, and uh, these in a recent report by uh, Act A have been highlighted as insufficient funding for Act A. Uh, and then of course, we have already heard uh, from other panel members, uh, a lot of different national as well as regional interests that uh, not just could, but have in fact compromised optimal use of scarce uh, COVID-19 products and resources more generally. And of course, the, the worrying thing, of course, as we see in the world today, 
uh, there really is very little political leadership and advocacy, so a lot of scepticism. So it's really very difficult to think about what to make of global solidarity. And I'm afraid that as far as IPR is concerned, it's not really quite helping the global solidarity situation. But I, I do think that it could. Uh, so it's, it's uh, not so much a matter of overhauling the entire system, but I do think that there are important tweaks that will need to be made. So as we have already heard, uh, COVAX, so that's the vaccine arm of Act A, uh, hasn't really worked very well, uh, at least not as planned. Uh, as we've already heard, uh, and, and this was a news report in Financial Times uh, published last week, uh, so uh, wealthy countries having 16 times more vaccines per capita than poorer countries. So of course, uh, this whole debate around booster shorts is, is really quite troubling. And, um, and then of course, we have the other problem of wealthy countries bypassing WHO. And, and, I, and I think that that's um, one of the key challenges that we will need to think quite hard about. So this of course links up with what has been mentioned in terms of political leadership as well as global solidarity. So if wealthy countries are, are able to simply bypass uh, the COVAX and purchase vaccines for themselves, of course this puts pressure, immense pressure for that matter on the overall availability of vaccines and uh, COVAX had to in turn rely on donations, which uh, as we all know, are extremely uh, sporadic and unpredictable. So, so we really can't say. And then uh, and to the point on uh, regional as well as national interests, of course here we see uh, production of vaccines uh, being halted in India. And of course that's uh, uh, because it needed to respond to its own outbreak. Uh, of the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. So, so there are a number of challenges with Act A itself. So we've heard the, the challenges for Act A, but if we look at Act A itself, uh, so there are um, concerns with appropriate governance. So here we have got very different organizations with, uh, uh, with different missions, visions and values coming together. Uh, but in a way that, that is quite lacking in coherence. And then, of course, if you look at uh, the COVAX setup with, with Gavi and SAPI being uh, main uh, constituent entities, you'd see that they are themselves represented by very different uh, entities or, for that matter, individuals. So there is also within Act A absence of uh, definitive decision making uh, structures, I would say, uh, as, as, as well as a, a body for that matter. So we find that there are multiple centers of formal decision making and, uh, and a, a very distributed notion of legal accountability. So, so that I think is one of the problems in terms of having a, a coherent response to the pandemic, particularly in terms of the availability of countermeasures. So uh, there are also concerns about uh, Act A's legitimacy in, in uh, making decisions with very wide implications so that we do know. Uh, I think it's important to highlight that while you'd see in the earlier diagram, WHO appearing in uh, all of the key pillars of Act A, it does not, however, exercise oversight over Act A, but has a variety of roles that are more technical, advisory, or otherwise administrative in nature. So um, representation, of course, is also a problem. If we look at SEPI, for instance, there is no uh, uh, government from a low or middle income country holding a representation, uh, representational seat. So, um, so that perhaps also might go back to uh, some of the concerns that the previous speaker has highlighted. So quite a few challenges, as you see. And then how do we think about moving forward? So. Um, UNDP, of course, just recently uh, released a report entitled Leaving No Country, and of course, by extension, All Persons Behind. So uh, I'm afraid that uh, we are very short of this particular position. So uh, we're in a situation where, of course, we all recognize that COVID is everyone's problem. But of course, as the saying goes, where everyone's problem is concerned is also nobody's problem. So uh, it's not very clear who is responsible for what and, and whether there is a, a, a coherent response for that matter. So um, in terms of uh, the thinking about IPR, 
it, it does seem that, of course, there's quite a bit of discussion. And as we've seen, uh, there are uh, uh, credible objections being raised to uh, the whole IP waiver issue. But I argue that, of course, that uh, is a rather disembedded uh, understanding or, or construction of the intellectual property regime, both international and domestic. Uh, so, but we have that at the moment. We do have these functional uh, IPRs. And as we've seen, uh, there are clear benefits that come from them. So they may, perhaps, we, we don't know for sure, they, they could well have contributed to the vaccines that we currently have. But of course, as, the spe uh, as other speakers have mentioned, there are also other contributing factors. Uh, but then we also have broad systemic arrangements like Act A, but the, again, they're too broad. So between the very specific and the very general, uh, there are uh, huge gaps in terms of how best to think about the problems and how best to respond to them. So in terms of global health research policy, I do think that we um, at this stage need to think about how to secure longer term benefits, how to overcome the collective action problem, which I, I don't think we seem to have, even in the light of this uh, very difficult pandemic with huge loss of lives. We do need more effective coordination in contrast to competition or for that matter, nationalism. Uh, so when I say whole life informational approach, I do mean that we do need to consider how to make important informational resources available in a way that could capacitate countries or other important stakeholders to use these kind of resources and transform them into uh, hopefully liberty or agency enhancing activities or measures. Of course, what's most directly pertinent to the pandemic will be uh, pandemic countermeasures, first of all. I do think we need to go back into discussions on affirmative technology transfer. It has very close links with uh, development ethics. Uh, so uh, um, I, I, I do think we, we also need to think very carefully about what uh, solidarity and equity would mean and whether we do need ultimately some sort of entity that could champion or galvanize action. So in my view, I do think that there is a need to empower WHO and for it to work effectively with partners like WIPO. And here, uh, I am happy to make reference to uh, Professor Gostin's uh, most recent work. Of course, he speaks to uh, how neoliberalism or thinking uh, in that line has contributed to the erosion of WHO's capacity to respond to pandemics such as the one that we have here. But of course, uh, equity remains a serious concern uh, as uh, is solidarity. We know that following the pandemic, there will be a K-shaped economic recovery. So that will mean that those who have will do better and those who have not will be even worse off. So this is not going to help um, uh, uh, our uh, injustice or inequities that, that we find today or otherwise to, to support better collective action. So there will be greater divergence in scientific regulatory as well as production capacities. And then of course, uh, all of these will be exacerbated by new challenges uh, particularly uh, climate change that, uh, uh, as we know, is more likely to uh, have more pandemics occur or pandemics of this sort, outbreaks of this sort for that matter, uh, than to reduce it. So with this, um, thank you so much for your attention uh, and for this opportunity uh, to be involved in a very important discussion. So uh, back to you, Houghton. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Calvin. I like the image uh, of HKU that you, you're showing. It's, um, it's really hopeful. And as I mentioned, I, I, I like the word uh, uh, Professor Galston used, empowering. And, and at the same time, I also like the word that you use, re relational. So you said the property rights are relational. I think this word is very important uh, to this conference and to, to the audience and then to the whole world as well. Because because all you talked about and all, you know, other panelists talked about earlier is all about how we present the problem as a relational problem. And so, um, so that's great. And uh, you Thanks so much. refer to Anna's uh, you know, work showing that our 
works, uh, you know, our works are also relational. So, and let, let's move on to the uh, next speaker um, who is Professor Peter Lee. Uh, so Peter's work has already been referenced by uh, earlier panel, and so, which is another way of showing how relational our work is. Uh, so uh, we can't wait for Peter's talk. So Peter is the Mar currently the Martin Luther King Professor of Law at the University of California, Davis School of Law. Um, Peter, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. And thanks to the organizers for facilitating this very important conversation. Um, I do have some slides to share. So let me try to share them now. So hopefully that looks okay. Yes. All right, I'm gonna assume that's okay. Um, so this is a talk called Tacit Knowledge Transfer and the Patent Bargain. Uh, not surprisingly, I'm going to draw upon some themes articulated by previous panelists, but hopefully add a few new perspectives as well. So as with several other commentators, I think it's important to emphasize the significant public support that combined with private initiative in developing COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, typically it takes three to nine years to move from sequencing a virus through phase one clinical testing of a vaccine. For COVID-19 vaccines, this was rapidly accelerated to six months. And certainly we had significant and rapid investments by private biopharmaceutical companies like Pfizer. But additionally, uh, in many ways, these developments reflect a long history of public support. So I'm gonna focus on mRNA vaccines. According to one commentator, the path to mRNA vaccines during the work of hundreds of researchers over more than 30 years. And so I think it's important to emphasize the federal or governmental contributions to vaccine development. And I wanna delve a little bit into the science here and highlight contributions to two technologies really at the core of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, so first are genetically engineered spike proteins that elicit an immune response. As was mentioned earlier, uh, this has been the subject of federally funded research for a long time. And in fact, the NIH partnered with Moderna on the COVID-19 vaccine. Additionally, another important technology is RNA modification that allows engineered RNA to slip past immune defenses. And this too arose from federally funded research at the University of Pennsylvania, which patented the discoveries. So this is kind of the prehistory of governmental support for vaccine development. Obviously, much has been made about the more recent history. Uh, in particular, Operation Warp Speed provided about $18 billion for very rapid vaccine development. Moderna received about two and a half billion. Pfizer received an advanced purchase order of almost $2 billion for 100 million doses of vaccine, thus greatly reducing its risk exposure. All right, so through both public funding and private initiative, we have these fantastic vaccines, but as we've been discussing today, there are controversies over access to these vaccines. We've seen vast global inequality. As of September of 2021, almost 60% of people in 63 high income countries were fully vaccinated, but only 1% of people in the 26 lowest income countries were fully vaccinated. So obviously, a gross disparity. Now, there are lots of reasons, I mean, exploring a lot of these reasons for these global disparities, patents have been viewed as one key constraint on access. And Moderna, BioNTech, Kiravac, and GlaxoSmithKline run about half of the mRNA vaccine patent applications. All right, so all of this intersects with the proposal that we've been discussing at the WTO to temporarily waive TRIPS IP protections during the pandemic. Uh, obviously, this has been opposed by most biopharmaceutical companies. And one counter argument is that even if patents were waived, other parties could not manufacture patented vaccines in industrial quantities without tacit knowledge. 
And this counter argument is particular salience to Moderna. Moderna has pledged not to enforce its COVID-19 patents during the pandemic. So it can colorably say that its patents are not constraining access. That being the case, it's refused to share tacit knowledge and manufacturing know-how broadly. So this brings me to, I think, the kind of main topic of my talk, which is the patent quid pro quo, the kind of the broad societal bargain that informs the patent system. So Professor Price mentioned this earlier, uh, inventors receive exclusive rights in exchange for disclosing a novel, useful, and non-obvious invention. It's a grand bargain that informs our patent system. And this is reflected in statutes. So in the United States, in our Patent Act, we have 35 USC section 112, which spells out an enablement requirement. A patent must enable a technical artisan to make and use a patent invention without undue experimentation. So the notion is that uh, a technical artisan in a field, like a vaccine scientist or engineer, could sit down, read a patent, and understand how to make and use that invention. And uh, this disclosure function plays a number of important functions. Uh, it plays a number of important roles. So disclosure must place competitors on equal footing as patentees. And the US Supreme Court said this, upon the expiration of the patent period, the knowledge of the invention inures to the people for this enabled without restriction to practice it and profit by its use. To this end, the law requires such disclosure to be made in the application for patent. So here again, disclosure is in some sense the consideration for this grand societal quid pro quo. Now, the Supreme Court was here talking about patent expiration, but these principles would also seem to apply to situations of compulsory licensing or IP waiver, where again, the disclosure places competitors on equal footing uh, as patentees. All right, so it's important to emphasize the role of, of disclosure in patent mediated technology transfer. Um, at a high level, we can disaggregate technology transfer to two different elements or two different transactions. Uh, there's a legal element. You have to have the legal right to practice some invention. This could be accomplished through voluntary licensing, patent expiration, compulsory licensing, or IP waiver. Uh, but this legal ability to practice an invention is really hollow unless you have the cognitive ability to actually understand and apply this technology. And in theory, patent disclosure satisfies the cognitive element of formal technology transfer. So Dan Burke reminds us that codification results in commodification of knowledge allowing it to be treated more as an object of trade or exchange. All right, so there are a number of limitations to that disclosure. One which several panelists have already discussed is tacit knowledge, right? So Michael Polanyi once famously said, we can know more than we can tell. Now the patent context we're referring here to technical know-how not captured in the patent disclosure. I think it's important to draw some distinctions. Tacitness is a question of degree. So at one end of the spectrum, you might have latent knowledge, which is codifiable, but not actually codified. At the far end of the spectrum, you might have truly tacit knowledge that's not really amenable to codification. And it's also important to distinguish between tacit knowledge related to practicing some basic pen invention and then tacit knowledge related to commercializing a pen invention at industrial scale. So Professor uh, Price noted this as well, but there's a big difference between creating a vaccine that might work in kind of very constrained conditions in a laboratory, as opposed to ramping up industrial manufacture of that vaccine, so you're making hundreds of millions of doses. All right, so tacit knowledge has been very much the core of the challenges of transferring vaccine technology. This is from a vaccine expert at Doctors Without Borders. You need someone to share the process because it's a new technology. One of the problems we have is that the scientific literature about industrial scale manufacturing of mRNA vaccines is so slim. This is why it's not just about a recipe, it's about an active and full tech transfer.
So these challenges of transferring tasks of knowledge, I think, perhaps create some opportunity to revisit the patent quid pro quo. Now, I'm not claiming here that Moderna BioNTech and other patentees have not satisfied the existing new requirement. People have made that argument. Uh, my focus is a little bit different. So thinking ahead, I'd suggest that various reforms can enhance tasks of knowledge disclosure by patentees. So I'll suggest a few things. So first is rehabilitation of the best mode requirements. Uh, it's a bit odd. This is still technically a requirement of getting a patent, but because of recent patent reforms, it basically is never enforced. This is a notion that if you're a patentee who knows the specific techniques or instrumentalities that are the best way of practicing your invention, you must disclose them. I think this can do a lot of valuable work in codifying tacit knowledge. There can also be an ongoing requirement of disclosure related to commercial application. So as it is now, you submit your patent application, it has a disclosure, it's largely fixed, and you actually have incentives not to amend that. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, however, a lot of valuable information about technology arises after a patent issues, uh, perhaps during the process of commercialization. And so perhaps we can think about a requirement, an ongoing requirement, to disclose this type of information as well. There are, of course, challenges of monitoring and verification, right? So how would a patent office know five years after issuance that some important tacit knowledge arose in the mind of the inventor? So I think, I think that we can concretize this. Uh, so for vaccines and diagnostics and therapeutics, uh, perhaps a requirement to disclose manufacturing information used for regulatory approval. Uh, professors uh, Price and Rye have written about this. Uh, another avenue is also uh, the ability to require disclosure during FDA approval. I'm sympathetic to that proposal as well, but it seems that there are policy levers available uh, to kind of extract this task of knowledge. And this is really aimed at disclosing latent knowledge. So again, this is knowledge that is not codified, but it is codifiable. And so I'll just mention here that there are a variety of factors that actually favor tacit knowledge disclosure related to mRNA vaccines. Uh, so one factor has to do with the complexity of information. So obviously some technical details need to be worked out, but one of the most important advantages of mRNA over conventional vaccines is its relatively simple manufacturing. Uh, as other commentators have noted, uh, mRNA manufacturing is an enzymatic process rather than a biological one involving live cells, right? So the information itself may not be too complex so as to constrain transfer. Additionally, there's a notion of modularization. Uh, Moderna actually uses a modular production kit, which in theory can aid technology transfer. And then finally, there's a the notion of absorptive capacity. So innovators push tacit knowledge, but adopters have to receive it the absorptive capacity refers to their capacity to understand and internalize exogenous information. And we see here, and Professor Rai uh, highlighted this, uh, high technical expertise and manufacturing capacity at various sites around the world, particularly in India, South Africa, and Brazil. All right, so uh, I've been focusing so far on kind of transferring latent knowledge. So that is information that is codifiable, but not currently codified. How can we think about promoting more intensive tacit knowledge transfer? Well, here, and this actually picks up a theme from a prior presentation, I think we need to think about a relational model of technology transfer that involves direct interpersonal and institutional linkages. And we see this in case studies of university industry technology transfer. And tacit knowledge is particularly relevant for these types of inventions that are very early stage and embryonic. And we see that transferring tacit knowledge often requires direct interpersonal interaction. So according to one study for 71% of university inventions licensed, continued cooperation of the inventor and the licensee was required for further development. There really is no substitute to actually sitting down with the inventor or the inventive entity and understanding the technology directly. 
All right, and so we see different modalities of a relational model of technology transfer. So really a continuum. So at one end, we could have rather thick contractual engagements, right? So not just one-off arm's length interactions, but contractual engagements that persist over some time. Uh, this is exemplified in consulting agreements between academic inventors and commercial licensees. Uh, additionally, we also see joint ventures and organizational meshing as a way of transferring tasks of knowledge. This is evident in joint research consortia, for instance, CIMATEC, which is a research consortia in the semiconductor industry. And finally, we see far end full blown organizational integration. Uh, and this reflects the knowledge based theory of the firm, where the firm emerges as an entity that can economize on uh, transferring information. And we see internal tech transfer from parent to subsidiaries in multinational firms. So uh, we actually see examples of this relational model technology transfer. Uh, COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing has been transferred. Moderna transferred technology to contract manufacturer Lanza in about six months. Johnson & Johnson asserted direct control over manufacturer vaccine of emergent biosolutions before emergent ran into even bigger problems. And then uh, Pfizer and BioNTech it deals with more than 20 contract manufacturing organizations. So it is possible to transfer this technical knowledge. All right, so how might this relate to the patent quid pro quo? Uh, could we require direct personal or institutional linkages as a condition of obtaining and maintaining a patent I would say not likely, that's a bridge too far. Uh, there are significant difficulties in compelling, monitoring and verifying interpersonal tasks of knowledge as a condition of obtaining and maintaining a patent. However, I think that we can think about uh, expanding the quid pro quo for publicly funded patentees. And here we can leverage enormous public investments and in privately patented technologies. Uh, we've seen attempts to do this or calls to do this to promote greater access to end products. So this is uh, from a German member of the European Parliament. He said, we funded the research. You could have agreed on a paragraph that says you were obliged to give it to poor countries in a way that they can afford it. Of course, you could have. We can also use a leverage of public funding to promote greater access to tacit knowledge. And so we might want to think about enhanced tacit knowledge sharing as an obligation in exchange for public support. And perhaps we can require participation in knowledge sharing networks like the WHO's COVID-19 technology access pool or direct consulting engagements with manufacturers. And I think it would be reasonable to provide financial and personnel assistance uh, to facilitate such tacit knowledge transfer. So the model is essentially one where public institutions are providing significant value and consideration to downstream patentees. In return, they have certain obligations of transferring tacit knowledge. So let me just conclude by highlighting significant public contributions to private innovation, ensuing controversies over patents and access to COVID-19 vaccines. Even if patents were waived, there would be challenges of transferring tacit knowledge. This might provide an opportunity to revisit the patent quid pro quo, to increase disclosure requirements for patentees. We can also think about enhancing the quid pro quo for publicly funded patentees and requiring interpersonal and institutional linkages between technology developers and adopters. And so with that, I'll close, and I very much look forward to the ensuing conversation. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, 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 so I like the word tested quite a lot. Uh, I, you know, it appears uh, most frequently in your talk, in your talk but actually uh, the word that I like most is disclosing. And, you know, it's a legal requirement. Um, and, you know, disclosing is also very important. For example, for the purpose of contact tracing, you have to dis disclose your whereabouts. And uh, so, and for, for the purpose of this talk, you know, disclosing is also very important. You, you know, uh, no disclosing know-how, you know, trade secrets, tests and knowledge, all kinds of things. They're very, uh, they're, they're crucial for, um, you know, uh, for combating the, uh, you know, the current pandemic. Um, so let's move on to uh, Q&A. We still have some time.
And um, um, so there's a question for, uh, there's a question asked by Malavi. It's a question directed to um, uh, Fumi. So, um, so Malavi said that earlier today, Dr. Kuakwa reminded us of the WIPO mandate a world where innovation and creativity from anywhere are supported by intellectual property. And this for the good of everyone. But for our current system that, that uh, you know, does not adequately recognize that all countries are not able to engage in knowledge production as Professor Ariwa uh, compelling describes. Uh, so pr Professor Ariwa's arguments uh, that we need to focus on funding for local uh, R&D is right on. But this begs another question. Given the hollowness of the promise of the TRIPS agreement and tech transfer to develop, developing countries, why should developing countries participate in the global IP system at the expense of their local needs? How do we decolonize TRIPS? Oh, what a um, mind-blowing question. So. Uh, Professor Ariwa, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I first of all, this, I wanted to this, thank. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, this is a okay. really an eye opening question. So, yes, I wanted to thank Professor Sundar for asking the question. I think it's a critically important question that I think countries need to engage in. Um, in a detailed analysis and assessment of what the costs and benefits are of intellectual property to them. I think, and this will vary depending on local context. Um, I think the frameworks we have in place, both globally, and locally have been heavily influenced by the processes that I describe as reflecting colonial overhang. This, me this means that um, these processes weren't necessarily implemented with an eye to what are the local needs in these countries. So I think uh, at, at a minimum, countries need to really readily understand from a local perspective, what the benefits are to them from IP. And um, also take account of uh, how we've we talked a little bit about exceptions and limitations, how to best implement those, but also look at the frameworks with an eye to sort of how do we in the future uh, disrupt the patterns of inequitable um, technology transfer, our inequitable and marginalized participation in global a global economy context, because the current path is what got us things like trip trips. And I don't think that's going to disrupt the patterns that I note in my book. I think to disrupt those patterns, we have to really think about what really works in these local contexts and think about in future discussions of intellectual property, really having a keen eye to that as the, it, as the frameworks are implemented. So I think it re requires the recalibration of processes and approaches. And I, otherwise, I don't think we're going to decolonize anything, certainly not decolonize trips. And it may well be at the end of the day, some countries conclude that we can't decolonize this from our perspective. And then they have to make a decision as to how do they proceed. I think what we need are hybrid and innovative and creative approaches to take account of how do we disrupt these past patterns. So I have a follow-up question. Um, you mentioned the local uh, conditions and local realities, and these are very extremely important. And uh, we we need to respond to those ne local needs. Uh, and this this is absolutely important. But one thing that has troubled me quite a lot is that it seems that you know the global attention on the situation, the COVID situation in Africa, is not as you know, strong as the attention that has been directed to uh, many other regions. For example, when India, you know, uh, earlier in May, when India reached the highest point of, uh, you know, death rates, uh, you know, or death tolls caused by COVID, you know, the global attention was there, you know, and we, we focused on for example, the United States, where there, there is a large number of infections, but, but it seems to me that the media coverage or the media uh, focus, you know, directed to Africa is a lot less. In, and at the same time, the vaccination, uh, you know, it's, you know, Africa is absolutely under vaccinated and it's, it has the lowest vac vaccination rate in the world. So what is going around here? It se seems to me that, you know, this kind of, is it, What's the best way of you know, encouraging people to so, you know, pay more attention to the local needs? And how, how do we you know, incentivize people to you know, pay more attention to Africa? Well, I think, uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And this is a historical problem. Um, African countries are 
the most marginalized countries in the world if we just look at economic and uh, health statistics. So out, so the, the one reason that COVID, at least prior to Delta, hadn't impacted African countries more severely is the fact that the median age in African countries is much lower than it is in, in certainly in Europe and the United States. African countries have a median age of around 19.5. Um, United States is at 38, Europe is at 43. And we know COVID prior to uh, Delta, at least, had a, a more minimal impact with the younger population. So that's one reason COVID initially might have hit, uh, might have been less, seemingly had a less impact in African countries. But because of problems of measurement, we don't really know the impact. I think part of what we need to disrupt is a pattern of marginalization by which African countries are seen as a source of extracting profit. And notably, the current pattern enables external parties, the varied external parties, to extract significant profits from African contexts because African countries, there's, it, there's a continuing issue of the inability to add or uh, add local value um, in varied contexts and certainly do things like manufacture vaccines locally outside of a few specified contexts such as South Africa. That, in, that means Africa can be a very profitable way to do business. And we have suggestions that Moderna was actually charging higher prices to these countries than they were charging actually in Europe and other parts of the world. So I think part of what we need to focus on is how do we disrupt patterns of marginalization that le have led to current circumstances? And that means really thinking about how do you actually decolonize things that are deeply colonially, even though we don't recognize them as such. So decolonial approaches are something that really need to be focused on in, in African contexts. So decolonizing existing patterns, which will require different solutions in different contexts. But I think there needs to be a, a focus on that. Thank you. Um, I got a question for Calvin. So, so Calvin, you mentioned uh, you know the, the 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 deep problems about the you know uh, leadership failures uh, around the world, and uh, you know so. But still, I think uh, we need to, uh, as you proposed, you know, we we need to think about the the, uh, the whole range of problems in a very uh, you know uh, hopeful or uh, structural way, and so. My question is, you know, which institution or which government is the most important one for uh, dealing with the current pandemic? And, and so, um, you know, maybe the, the, the institution versus the government. So who should really, uh, you know, take the lead to uh, deal with this, uh, the mass, you know, globally? Th thanks so much for the question, Houghton. Uh, it was certainly an important one. Um, uh, of, of course, what I've indicated, suggested in my slides is that um, the WHO could take on this role because it does, or it should have that mandate under the IHR, the International Health Regulations. It is, after all, the only health agency in the world. So, uh, so it does have, for that matter, legitimacy. But in terms of the entire setup, I, I do think, again, from the capabilities approach, that, uh, that the Act A setup could be something to work with. Of course, there are problems, both in terms of uh, challenges that it has encountered and also some of the more inherent uh, challenges within itself. Uh, I do think that uh, within that particular setup, we can think of how it could interface with uh, intellectual property systems around the world. And particularly in thinking about um, how or what sort of information ought to be disclosed, uh, what might be appropriately supported uh, with pattern waivers, and how we can think about these sort of information in relation to the capabilities of either countries on their own or perhaps as collectives in developing countermeasures. And I think that uh, it is ultimately very intricately linked to considerations of development, uh, particularly for uh, the low and middle income countries. So, so we can't get away from ultimately the sort of commitments or the normative commitments that we are confronted with. Uh, and I, I fall back on the Rosian position that ultimately, if we do accept uh, intellectual property systems as social institutions, then the first virtue of any social institutions must be justice. So if it does not advance justice uh, as an outcome, then I think we need to have some serious thinking in terms of 
its failings and the sort of measures that we ought to adopt in response. So thanks very much again. I, I, I hope that answers your question, or at least in terms thank of- you Thank you very much, Calvin. Thanks again. Uh, so uh, we got two questions for Peter on the table. And the first question is about, uh, uh, you know, Peter, uh, you know, questions about how you think about the, the you know, IP waiver under the TRIPS agreement. Um, so I think that the question could be rephrased in this way. Uh, would, uh, you know, for example, would, would the IP waiver promote the transfer of uh, test knowledge or not? How do you think about this, uh, you know, uh, IP waiver? Sure, so um, a couple of things come to mind. So uh, initially the threat of an IP waiver can actually do a lot of productive work here. So uh, companies don't want the IP waiver to pass. And so to the extent that they might try to enhance their own production or even tacit knowledge transfer to forestall political momentum and thus prevent an IP waiver, it can be useful in that regard. Uh, moving to if an IP waiver actually passes, I think it can actually do a lot of useful work in transferring tacit knowledge. Um, so the IP waiver covers not just patents, but also a variety of sections of TRIPS, including that which covers undisclosed information. And so uh, in theory, if the IP waiver passed and then a country adopted domestic legislation that really kind of enforced it uh, to its fullest capacity, then uh, trade secrets, uh, undisclosed information could be disclosed. Now, there are some kind of technical challenges uh, for instance, there's Supreme Court precedent indicating that if the US government discloses trade secrets, this is a taking and thus just compensation would have to be pr provided to uh, the other party. I think that's a reasonable kind of constraint here. Um, but I think that the short answer is yes. I think that an IP waiver, which specifically addresses uh, undisclosed information can do a lot of valuable work in disclosing tacit knowledge. Uh, great. The, the second question uh, here is the second question. So, Professor Lee, your suggestion of a hard requirement to disclose uh, tested knowledge when the technology is supported by public funds is right. Uh, but the lack of political will of even the Biden administration to use its leverage to this end is sorely disappointing. Uh, would an IP waiver that includes trade secret be enforceable to force sharing uh, test knowledge? I think this question is about how to unleash political power. More or less sure. about, uh, yeah, political power to promote the transfer of test knowledge. Sure, um, so relating to political will, I think that's an enormous problem. And I think that one of the themes of this pandemic is that there's a law in the books and a law in action. Um, and so for instance, on the domestic level, uh, there's a federal statute, the Bayh-Dole Act, that governs federally funded and privately patented inventions. Uh, funding agencies have merchant rights. They can actually issue compulsory licenses, but they never do this, right? So this power exists. It's never actually acted upon. I think NIH has received five petitions to grant merchant rights over the past several decades. It's never done so. Uh, on the international uh, stage, we've seen that there are existing flexibilities in TRIPS but there's a lack of political will to actually use them. So I hope that one of the outcomes of this pandemic is that there will be uh, greater momentum behind actually using these existing uh, flexibilities. And a lot of people actually are clamoring for NIH to exercise its margin rights with respect to um, patented vaccines. And then this I think leads into the tacit knowledge question which I kind of, uh, or the trade secret question which I kind of addressed. Um, you know, I think that if an IP waiver does actually pass, there may actually be enough political will to, again, actually legislate the appropriate statutes to put this into place so that uh, trade secrets can be disclosed, again, with the constraint that just compensation would probably, be have, to, would probably have to be paid uh, to those trade secret owners. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so um, we have finished this panel um, and um, how time flies, but we, I think we, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I found uh, 
three favorite words. One is uh, empowering, and uh, I think we have uh, this panel shows that there are a variety of ways of empowering developing countries to overcome this pandemic. As Calvin mentioned, everything is relational, so uh, it's uh, so it's great that we have found a lot of thoughts to push, for example, uh, leading in, uh, institutions and governments to, uh, you know, to work on, uh, the, you know, the, 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 to work together to overcome the uh, pandemic. And uh, Peter's talk shows that disclosing, I pick the word disclosing, disclosing is very important. Uh, so, uh, and this panel actually has disclosed a lot of useful information. So with that note, I would like to draw a close to today's program. And um, thank you so much for participating in this uh, uh, conference. I mean, the first day of the program, and we had a very exciting uh, uh, first day. And uh, so the, the conference will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, move moving on to the second day uh, tomorrow uh, morning Eastern time at eight a.m. And uh, we will have two towering figures in the IP Academy. Uh, Professor Willem Fisher and Professor Ruth Akadji to uh, deliver the keynote, the second keynote at the conference. So um, I urge uh, everybody to uh, show up, uh, you know, on time at 8 a.m. Eastern time and 8 p.m. Um, Hong Kong time. Thank you so much again for uh, joining us. I hope to see you all tomorrow morning, uh, Eastern time and uh, tomorrow evening, Hong Kong time. See you soon. Bye bye. Thanks so much, bye now.